Good morning and welcome to our worship here on the 26th of July. It's great to have you and wherever or whenever you're watching and listening to this service from. And today we're finishing on of our series in the book of Acts. And today we meet a man named Cornelius. Cornelius wasn't part of the in crowd. He was not a Jewish man by birth. He'd um, not been part of the Jewish people. But yet we see how God changes his life. And how the kingdom of God ripples out from just one particular people group to all people across the world. And so we want to um, say to you today, whoever you are, whatever your position, whatever your background, whether you're a, a devout Christian or you're, you're a convinced skeptic or atheist, you're welcome here um, as we worship together. Whether it's just to explore or whether it's to worship, we love, uh, we're so glad that you've been able to join us here for this worship here today. Let me open up in prayer as we approach our God and approach our King. Let us pray. Father God, you are so good to us. We praise you and we worship you, for you are the God of heaven and earth. You are the one who is before all things, who sees and who knows everything. Lord, our minds cannot compute just how great and how grand you are that you hold the whole universe in your hands. But Lord, we ask today, that as we come from our different um, homes and backgrounds, that we would know your special close touch with us here today. We hope that your Holy Spirit will come and flood our hearts and our lives, that our homes would become places of joy and laughter and goodness that flows from Jesus. Father, may you surround us each today with your great love. For we know that we don't deserve it, that our lives have not matched up with what you ask of us. But yet you are a God of grace and a God of compassion, who shows grace and abundance, abundance beyond measure. So pour out your grace upon us today. Help us once again to trust in Jesus, who has died for us and risen again, so that our hearts may be free, our lives may be filled with goodness and not evil. That our um, tongues may sing of your praise, that our minds might be filled with the goodness of God. Lord, come and do a new thing amongst us, we pray. Be with us wherever we are, however we're feeling. May you come and change our lives from the inside out. We pray these things in the name of the God who is greater than our minds can comprehend, but who is more closer than we ever thought possible. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing um, together and uh, we're going to sing together the great song called Before the Throne of God Above. If you're using the church hymnody, it's hymn number 466, Before the Throne of God Above. Thank you. 
Just before we go on, I uh, just want to uh, give you some notices for our church family in particular. The first is that uh, this coming Wednesday will be the last in our current series of what's been called Taking It Further, where we explore uh, the passage on Sunday in a little bit more depth. So if you've not joined us before, you're still very welcome to do so. Um, but we meet on Wednesday on Zoom at 7pm and the details will be in the description box below for that. Second thing I want to say is that our Kirk session, our leadership team are meeting up on uh, this coming week and part of what we'll be discussing and looking at is about the reopening of our buildings for worship and other um, groups and activities and events as well. Um, and when we make a decision uh, and about reopening, uh, a bit more clari clarity with that, uh, we will let you know. So um, please don't think that you've not been told anything. Uh, we are still looking at that, still wanting to explore what it means to reopen and how we're going to put that in place that keeps us all safe, but also allows us to worship in a way that's um, filled with joy and with hope and the goodness of God nonetheless as well. So when we let, when we know, we will let you um, we'll find, we'll let you find out about that as well through um, our Sunday services, but also in other ways um, as well through our emails and online as well. Next thing I want to say um, is that many of you will know already that um, Kirsty, my wife and I, um, I've got a baby um, due. Um, if you're watching or listening to this on Sunday, it's actually due in 16 days time. Uh, we're quite sure that our baby will come a little bit earlier than that. Um, so I might not be here next week. I might be already on paternity leave. But please be um, aware that even though I'll be off for a few weeks on paternity leave and a bit of annual leave, that we'll still have a Sunday worship services and we'll still have folk available for pastoral care um, should you need that, should you want to chat um, to someone. And uh, yeah, when we have that baby, we'll let you know. But we're going to turn to, to God's word now. Um, and if you've got a Bible, please do turn with me. It's Acts chapter 10. We're now in Acts chapter 10. If you've got a Bible on you or near you, you might want to turn to Acts chapter 10 and we'll be looking through part of it together today. Um, let me just read a couple of verses at the beginning of um, the chapter and I'll explain um, a little bit of what happens uh, in the middle of the chapter and again we'll read um, some of the closing verses as well. So the first verse, a couple of verses of Acts chapter 10 um, say this. At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need as he prayed to God regularly. The rest of or the next part of um, that um, early part of the chapter tells us that an angel from God comes to speak to Cornelius and says that his prayers have been heard, that he's wanting to find out more about God. And he says, Cornelius, go and send for a man named Peter and he will come and tell you more about what it means to know and to love God. And so that's what he does. He sends off some servants to go and find Peter. At the same time, Peter um, is um, told about um, and he's on a journey. Peter goes um, on a roof to pray and he becomes hungry and he ends up falling into a sleep. And in this sleep, he, he has a great vision from God. In this vision, there is a, what's described as a large sheet filled with animals of all different kinds, birds, reptiles, mammals, and many others as well. Many of these animals, if you were Jewish, you were not allowed to eat. And we know that Jews today still, um, have the, many of these regulations still in place. Certain animals they will not um, touch or go near or eat. And so Peter sees um, all of these animals coming down to him. And God says, go and kill and go and have your lunch. Peter says, no, I can't do that. God, you know that I can't. For me as a Jewish person, I'm not allowed to, I'm not supposed to. But it happens again and God says, go and take something to eat. And Peter protests again and says, I can't do that, God. And then God says to him in verse 15, do not call it anything impure that God has made clean. And so Paul, uh, Peter sorry, begins to think about this vision and what it all means. Just as he awakes from this, the men who Cornelius had sent arrive at his door and they say, come with us. We want you to meet a man named Cornelius. He wanted to meet with you. And so he goes and meets Cornelius and he stands in the door and he asks him, why was it 
that you sent for me. Cornelius says, God told me to come and tell you to do so. And so in verse 34, we'll pick it up there, Acts chapter 10 from verse 34. Peter begins to speak. And I realise how true it is that God does not show favouritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message that God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of all. You know what has happened through the province of Judea, beginning at Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him in a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses that God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came in all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even upon the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of them being baptised with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have done so. So he ordered that they be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. Amen. And so we see here that um, Peter meets with Cornelius and uh, his life's, um, the life of Cornelius and the life of those with him um, are changed by God. Some people say that their childhood or their teenage years were some of the best years of their life. I'm not so sure about that though. I, looking back, I just remember childhood and teenage years being a whole load of people battling to be part of the in crowd. The people with the latest phones or gadgets. When I was at school in early secondary school, I was in the days of when MP3 players were just um, um, becoming popular and when the earliest smartphones were on the market. When people tried to constantly keep up with whatever the newest trend was. You had to like the same kind of music as everyone else or wear the same kind of clothing or like the same stuff. In my days it was WWE wrestling or particular games on the Xbox or supporting the right kind of football club. I don't know who that guy is who gets to decide that's what the trendy thing is. But if you know who he is, let me know because I want a word with him. But does God only care or want to save the Jewish people? That's what the early church had to wrestle with. Does God care about these people only? Or does he care about all kind of people? That's what the early church had to wrestle with because Christianity flowed out of the Jewish faith, it being the fulfilment of the promises that God had been stating through all of the Old Testament right from our first parents. The early church had to work out, does God still focus upon the people of Israel or is this something bigger now because Jesus had lived and died and risen again? In Acts chapter 10, we see God revealing to Peter in the uh, vision that I mentioned about the sheep and the animals and God saying that all things we're now clean. We see that Peter realises that the kingdom of God was no longer going to revolve around a particular ethnic group, the Jewish people descended from Abraham, but rather it was rippling out to the corners of the world, crossing cultures and ethnicities, creeds and colours. Peter comes to this wonderful realisation in verse 34. I now realise how true it is that God, accept, God does not show favouritism but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. That truth has been implied throughout the whole of the scriptures by earlier prophets who said that Israel was not chosen because it was good or perfect or wonderful in any way, but because God is full of grace 
and he wanted to show love to a particular people group at a particular time. Think back to the closing words of Jesus in Matthew 28 or in Acts chapter 1. The command is to go and make disciples of all nations. Jesus says that the people of God are to be the sharers of the good news of Jesus in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. Throughout his ministry, he'd said that there were people who were not Jewish who were, um, who were going to be part of his kingdom, that there were other sheep not of his fold, or that there were times when he will draw all people to himself. The problem is that for many years, the Jewish folk in the Old Testament had become complacent. They had just um, lapped onto the, the news that they were the chosen folk, and they'd lived not in response to that in a way that was full of, of grace and thanksgiving, but they had become complacent in their relationship with God. They thought, well, everything revolves around us and everyone else was just the unclean Gentile people. So God in his grace brings this vision to Peter to make it clear that what has been said in previous generations, that God is going to call all people to know him and to, to find joy in him, that this really was the case, that the good news of Jesus Christ and the salvation for all people really is offered to everyone. And so when Peter preaches to Cornelius in the household and the Holy Spirit falls upon them, then this is the result. Surely no one can stand in the way of them being baptised, he says. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have done so. Up till that point, the Jewish faith had been an almost exclusively Jewish group only. But now the door had been ripped off the hinges and people from all different groups um, could find the Holy Spirit being poured out in abundance upon them. The gospel, the good news of Jesus is for everyone. This passage needs to hit some of us square in the face today. Anyone of any colour, culture, nation, ethnic background, circumstance, language, orientation, age, ability, educational level or anything else, any other grouping that we might put people in, they are invited to come and to know the abounding, life-giving joy of God. In these past couple of months, we've seen um, all too often um, the, the heartache, the hurt, the pain that racism causes. We've seen the protests, we've seen the anger from many folk, from, from black and other ethnic groups, of just the persecution and the, and the, the, the hatred that sometimes they are faced with. And unfortunately, many churches have not gotten the memo that God sends to us in Acts chapter 10, that the gospel is good news for everyone. That's not to say that it doesn't challenge people, or it doesn't cause our lives to be altered in sometimes dramatic ways. God does challenge, shape, mould, and sometimes even terminates what once existed in order for us to find life and joy and freedom in Christ. But there are no groups, categories or substratas of humanity that are less deserving of this life-giving hope. All are welcome to come and to know. Whatever your tribe, whatever your language, whatever your people or your nation, whatever your colour, whatever your social or economic status, whatever your sin, whatever your creed, there is space in the kingdom of God for you through faith in Jesus Christ. Everyone can have a salvation story. That's what God is revealing to us here through the, the life of Cornelius and how his life is changed. Anyone, no matter Jew or Gentile, whoever your background or whoever you are, everyone can have a salvation story. But what does it take to have a salvation story? We find out in those first couple of verses that I read way back at the beginning of the chapter, that Cornelius was a really religious guy. If you could think about him in modern churchy terms, he was, he was doing all the right kind of churchy stuff. He came to worship every week. He was in three different committees. He did door duty. His wedding had been um, in the church building. He taught Sunday school. He organised Remembrance Day services. He was an all good, round, religious guy. But the thing is, it's clear that he's not saved, going by what happened. It's clear that if he died that night, 
He would not find himself awakening in the joy and the, the glory of heaven. Why? Because he didn't have a story of salvation. He was religious and he was devout, but that in itself wasn't good enough. Yes, he was a devout man who feared God. In other words, although he wasn't Jewish, he still tried to um, respect God and please him. He still gave alms to the Jewish people and he still prayed to God an awful lot. He was a very religious guy, but he wasn't in a right relationship with God. Despite all of his religious deeds, there was still a message he needed to hear and he had to listen to and respond to. This is an important lesson for all of us, that there are no religious deeds that are um, any good in and of themselves. For Cornelius still needed a relationship with Jesus Christ the Messiah, God's promised saviour to all humanity. It doesn't matter how committed we are to the church if we don't know Jesus. It's no use being religious if Jesus isn't our saviour. With all the good works that Cornelius had, he still needed Jesus. Think about it. If Cornelius had done enough to earn God's love, if he'd done enough to find his way into heaven, then he'd have been left alone. God would have left him and said, well, you're fine, you don't need me. But Cornelius did need a saviour. He still needed God. God would have left him alone, but God didn't leave him alone. He wanted Cornelius in this great, multicultural, beautiful, glorious kingdom of his. And so he sends Peter, go and tell Cornelius about Jesus. This is a mistake that many of us, I think, within and out with the church family and community make. Sometimes we think that we'll be justified by our own good works. It reveals itself in numerous ways. That as long as we don't commit some heinous evil, or as long as we're a respectable part of society, as long as we go to worship services every now and then, then that's exactly what God is looking for. But the scriptures are clear, that if you're trying to work your own way to heaven, that lie will only lead to eternal death instead. When Adolf Hitler rose to power in Germany, the first concentration camp he opened was in Dachau in southern Germany. The gate of the camp has become famous, with a slogan in the metal bars of the gate saying Arbeit macht frei, work leads to freedom. But it was a lie. There was no freedom through work that the people could um, carry out. One guard is known to sarc sarcastically told a prisoner that the only way out was not through work, but it was through the chimney of the crematorium. Work at Dachau did not lead to freedom. It only led to death for thousands of people. In the same way, the idea that your good works and deeds can make you right with God, that work will lead you to freedom with God, is a lie from Satan. All other religious groups and um, religions around the world are, are based on this idea that if you do enough stuff, then God or whatever it is will love you in a particular way. And that's kind of easy. Tick the right boxes, say the right prayers, don't mess up too bad and it's all good. People love that good feeling that religious works give to them. They feel that it makes them right with God. But it's a lie. Good works can never make up for all the stuff that we've ever done. All the lies and everything else that we've ever shared. All the times we've not loved and honoured and respected other people. How on earth can just being a nice person make up for all of that? All of us fall short of God's standards. You can say a thousand prayers, give all of your money to the poor, but at the end of the day, if we look carefully at our lives, we've still lied or lusted, we've still stolen or been proud or racist or arrogant or unkind, we've not honoured our mum and dad, we've not loved our neighbour as we love ourselves. Everyone who tries to earn their way to heaven by attending church services or giving money or teaching Sunday school classes will find that they also fall short. If our good works could make us right with God, Cornelius would have been first in the queue. He would have been right with God right at the beginning of that line, but he wasn't. His works could never make up for all that he'd ever done wrong. And so what is the solution? Well, we need to bathe ourselves in the grace of God. 
knowing that we have a loving Heavenly Father who eagerly desires for us to find joy and delight in Him. There is no passing, this is no passing joy, but it's an all-surpassing, exceedingly great joy that flows out of a heart that knows the love and the grace um, of God in our lives. It knows that we've been cherished and eternally loved by God. Over and over again, the Bible says that salvation comes by faith, by faith and by faith alone. It's not by our good works, but it's by trusting that Jesus Christ has paid a penalty for us, that he died in our place to cancel the wrath that should have been poured out upon you and me. Instead, it's poured out upon Jesus instead, who bears it willingly to set us free. His death for my life, his punishment for my freedom. The abundant, overflowing, never-ending, amazing grace of God allows me to know heaven and God forever. The most important question of our life is this. Have you come to a time when you realised that your good needs could never save you? And you've, have you put your faith in Jesus alone? If you, are, if you have done so, then you are saved. I think it's very possible that there might be some listening to this today who recognise it right now. They have never trusted in Jesus, that they've been basing their lives on good works. But now they realise that good works are not good enough, but only through trusting in Jesus. But the good news of the story is that it doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. It doesn't matter what colour you are, how much money you have, what your background is. If in your heart right now you repent of your sins and trust in Jesus, then you will be forgiven. You will find yourselves awakening in the paradise of heaven. And so I encourage you to think more of your salvation story and to rest in the grace of God. You and I will sin today, but there's no amount of stuff we need to do to earn God's love again. Just ask God for forgiveness. Say, God, I messed up. God forgives you and God loves you just as you are. He wants to change you and make you more like Jesus, but he loves you so much. He wants to change your life. He wants to make you more and more like Jesus. He wants to fill you with his grace and his abundance and his goodness and his joy. True freedom is found when we fall into the arms of our God and it has a heart filled with the joy of knowing the love of God and what he's done for us in Jesus. May you find freedom today. Give up your self-justification and turn again, perhaps for the first time, to Jesus the one who sets you free. Amen. Will you join with me in prayer um, as we approach our God again? Let us pray. Father, it astounds us that you don't go after the perfect people, that you don't only allow 100% um, perfect people into your kingdom, but rather you call us all, as sinful as we are, as messed up as often we can be, you still choose to show us love and grace and abundance. And Father, we're thankful that you have sent out your, your kingdom promises across the whole world, that people of all different backgrounds and nationalities, people of all different races and colours and creeds and ages and circumstances are welcomed into your kingdom. You invite them to come and to find life and joy and hope and peace in Jesus. And so Father, we ask today that if we ourselves have not yet trusted in you, you'll speak to our hearts by your Holy Spirit. You'll challenge us and prompt us to chase after you. Lord, we want to ask you that for help because so often we try and justify ourselves. So often we feel that if we're just good enough, we're nice enough, then that's good enough. But Lord, we recognise that and we know that we can never match up to your standards. So Father, if we've sinned and it's weighing us down, may you help us to trust in the God of grace, that he doesn't um, only love us when we're perfect, but that you love us even though we're imperfect, even though we mess up, even though we make mistakes, even though we sin against you. Lord, show us compassion, we pray. Awaken our hearts to your great love and to your great compassion. Lord, awaken us to see the God of grace, the God who shows grace that never ends. Oh Lord, come by your Holy Spirit 
and change us from the inside out, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Just quickly, just thinking about the story of Cornelius and how Cornelius was um, very different to what folk would have expected to be part of the church family. just want to um, recommend two books um, to you that I've got that I'd love to um, pass on to folk if they would li like to read them. Um, two stories about folk who perhaps, unfortunately, we wouldn't often expect to see within our church family, but who should be um, part of our church family. The first is um, a very short book by a man named Mez McConnell. Mez is a, is a missionary in Brazil, uh, or has been, and uh, now is a church um, pastor uh, in a church in Edinburgh, in a very poor part of the um, um, city there. Mez grew up in a very difficult um, part of life. His family abandoned him as a child. He um, often struggled with things like abuse and drugs and alcohol. He ended up in prison as well. His life is one of um, hardship and suffering, one that I guess a, a person that often we wouldn't expect to be um, or recognise as being the usual kind of person we might see in our church families. But folk like Mez, um, whose lives have been transformed by Jesus, are the very folk that God would love to see part of our church families, that I would love to see part of our church family. Folk whose life circumstances would make us um, feel perhaps e even sick um, at the thought of what he has went through but his life has been changed and he finds joy in Jesus so I'd love to give that book to anyone it's a wee short book, just about 20 or 30 pages or so um, explaining about his life and how his life has been changed the other one is a much bigger book um, it's called Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus by a man named Nabel Kashiri Nabel was uh, a former uh, Muslim who was passionate about his faith about Allah and about um, the Islamic faith. We started to question it and started to look in the claims of Christianity about who Jesus was and what Jesus claimed to have done and the resurrection appearances as well. And his life has similarly been transformed. It's an unexpected journey from Islam to Christianity. And he tells us too of how he has found joy and peace and hope in Jesus. And so I recommend these books to you. If you want to have a read of them, you're welcome to get in touch and I'd love to pass them on to you as well. We're going to sing our closing song of praise together. If you're using the Mission Praise Books, it's number 1259. We're going to sing together, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Or otherwise known as 10,000 Reasons. Let us close as we praise God in song. Bless the Lord, O my soul. <laughs>
And so may the grace and the hope and the joy of Jesus go with you, whatever your background or your circumstances or anything else that you might put yourself in a box with. May the God of grace and compassion come and flood your lives today with all of his goodness. And may that grace and that blessing go with you and all who you love today and forevermore. Amen. It's been so great to worship with you um, today. Um, please do um, join us again next week for worship and if you're able to join us afterwards for um, our Zoom virtual coffee time, uh, we'd love to see you at 11.45 for that. Um, may you be blessed in all that you do this week. God bless. Sinful